All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us on the eve of the 51st anniversary of Earth Day and the Leaders Climate Summit. We are also marking one year since the launch of the NGO Climate Compact. My name is Noam Unger, Vice President for Development Policy, Advocacy and Learning at Interaction. I'd first like to welcome all of our member CEOs as well as our US government colleagues. Uh, before we dive into the panel that Interaction CEO Sam Worthington will moderate, I wanna take a moment to briefly reflect on where we've been as a community uh, on climate and where we are now. Uh, last April, we launched the NGO Climate Compact. This was the largest collective effort that US-based global development and humanitarian NGOs had taken to push for joint solutions to address one of the most consequential crises of our time. To date, 89 NGOs have signed on, making four core commitments. One, to use the power of our voice to educate stakeholders and advocate for, pol for public policy change to support those hardest hit. Two, to mainstream climate and environmental considerations into all programs. Three, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and waste. And finally, to learn, to exchange lessons, listen to science, and be humble as we pursue progress. We know there is power in setting a goal and making these commitments. 50% of signatories made internal changes as a result of signing the NGO Climate Compact. Over the course of one year, we've quickly built up work streams corresponding to those commitments that now engage 350 staff and executives across the NGO sector. In those streams in just one year, we've held 25 learning events, roundtables, and working group meetings at all levels on climate, ranging on topics from indigenous rights in climate action to establishing organization-wide climate strategies and expanding investments in climate adaptation. 15 NGOs have started or recently completed their own greenhouse gas inventory since signing the Climate Compact, taking the first step towards decarbonizing relief and development work. Our working groups have engaged Congress on climate issues like never before, reaching nearly 100 offices since inauguration alone. Behind all these numbers is what it all means for vulnerable communities who didn't create the problem of climate change yet are bearing the brunt of it. The organizations present here have contributed to increasing USG funding for international climate mitigation and adaptation, vastly expanding the knowledge base across NGOs to see climate in all that we do and shaping key legislation and policies. One example of this is a new product that I'd like to briefly introduce uh, before we turn to the panel. In response to President Biden's executive order on tackling climate change at home and abroad, Interaction convened senior NGO leaders with climate adaptation experts and policymakers to unpack lessons learned on climate adaptation and integration. Today, we're launching a set of recommendations primarily for USAID, but really for all of us on climate adaptation and integration. Included in this report are examples from member organizations sharing best practices in implementing climate adaptation into their programs. The report can be found on Interaction's website and the link will be dropped into the chat box if it hasn't been already. Um, broadly, the recommendations are to ensure climate work is politically sustainable to elevate the needs of the most vulnerable, to enact changes to existing bilateral programs to integrate climate, to create economic the economic enabling environment through policy to support long-term climate adaptation amidst rising inequality, and to shape non-ODA financing mechanisms as well, especially US development finance. Before I turn it over to Sam, I wanna thank the many people who were involved in putting together today's event and leading our partnerships with the US government. I'd first like to thank the leadership and staff at USAID, Millennium Challenge Corporation, the Development Finance Corporation and the State Department for your continued engagement with our community. On our team, I'd especially like to highlight Lindsay Doyle, our Senior Manager for Climate and Sarah Nitz Nolan, our Senior Manager for Policy and Food Security. And I'd also like to thank Jenny Marin, Morgan Martinez, Jeremy Doran, Michelle Neal, Maya Sparkman, Brian Pride, Aaron Landy and Raina Fox. With that, Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Noam, for your leadership, and thank you all for being with us today. Um, this is a special week uh, for all of us and for our members. Earth Day, as we all know, celebrates the role of activism, advocacy, uh, and government leadership, all of us coming together to protect the only planet we have and the life that it sustains. We, we started the biannual CEO roundtable on climate leadership to sustain a, a high level of commitment, a sense of solidarity, but also a sense of urgency around what we need to do. 
Um, at our last roundtable, which was in October last year, right before the presidential election, we heard from young civil society leaders and activists who had started and led their own organizations and campaigns at a time when others were shying away from bold climate action. And we applaud their leadership. Although uncertain about the outcome of the elections, we, we remained hopeful uh, that we could do something in partnership with the US government. And today, right before 40 global leaders gather uh, for the US Climate Leaders Summit tomorrow, uh, it's a unique opportunity for us to reflect on how the political tides have shifted and to hear about the new administration's plans. Um, we will hear today from four leaders of the US government and I'll briefly introduce each of them. So Alexia Latortu is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, Ms. Latortu has, been, has over 20 years experience in international development with a focus on development finance, policy making and, and making markets work for people. She has been in high ranking roles, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the US Treasury Department, the World Bank. So welcome, Alexia. And then I'll just turn to Michelle Similis, who currently serves as Assistant Administrator for Policy and Planning and Learning at USAID. And prior to this role, Ms. Limis has, Ms. Limis has served as the Executive Director of one of our members, Bread for the World. She also held leadership roles at USAID in the House Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations, the Bill and Melinda Gates for Foundation and the Global Health Council. So welcome also to Michelle. And now turning to our third panelist, uh, David Marchest, who's a DFC's Chief Operating Officer. And prior to joining DFC, uh, Mr. Marshak was served as a senior leadership roles, uh, both in the Center for Presidential Transition at Dartmouth, Carlisle Groups, Covington, and multiple US government agencies, including State Department, USDR, and others. And again, also thank you, David, for joining us. And lastly, I want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Pershing, who's the senior advisor to John Kerry, uh, the US Special President John Boy for Climate at the Department of State. And prior to his appointment, uh, Dr. Pershing served as a director of uh, program environment at Hewlett Foundation. He was also the special envoy for climate change at the State Department and led US negotiator, uh, le was the lead US negotiator for the UN Framework and Convention on Climate Change. And really great panel and thank you all for, for being here. Um, following the panel, I'll turn to two leaders on, on the call here with us to get some brief NGO responses. I'll be hearing from Abby Maxim from Oxen America and Ambassador Daniel Speckard, uh, who heads uh, Chorus International. And from there, we'll have about 25 minutes of discussion uh, with the rest of the group. You know, and Jonathan, I understand that will have to leave us within an hour or so. And, uh, you know, especially as his and his office are hosting tomorrow's Leader Climate Summit, I imagine that your, your plate is rather full and really appreciate your ability to find, willingness to find an hour for us uh, this morning. Uh, for the rest of you, please feel free to put some, you know, posts in the chat box to go along, have, add, make sure your name, your organization is there so we can engage. And lastly, just to be clear that this is a recorded conversation will be shared with our community uh, and part of our monthly climate digest and uh, CEO uh, uh, corner that we get out to CEOs. So I just start the conversation here. So, you know, given the Biden administration has this long commitment now already in several months worth of addressing climate crises, and we're interested to learn how it's being implemented in each agency. So I'll turn over to you, Alexa, if you give us a, you know, sort of brief response of, could you tell us a little bit of how the MCC is planning uh, to meet this moment on climate? Over to you, Alexa. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, Noam. And first, I want to say I've long admired interaction and the work of your members, and I could not think of a better group with whom to celebrate the eve of Earth Day with. So thank you very much. Um, and indeed, hope is back and hard work is also back. Um, and it's been really heartening and exciting to see the deep commitment of the administration to the issue of, of climate change, both domestically, uh, frankly, and internationally. And we know, as Noam said so eloquently, that climate change poses the greatest risks to developing countries whose people, economies, and institutions are the least able to afford its consequences 
and or mitigate its devastating impact. And we also know that we're really behind on achieving the sustainable development goals in many parts of the world, notably in Africa, and that COVID-19 has resulted in the first setback in poverty in numbers in 20 years. And so if we collectively do not meet this moment, to, you know, um, climate change will reverse the significant development gains achieved and exacerbate global poverty and inequality in ways that will be exponentially greater than what we've seen with COVID. And so the fate of people and planet and prosperity are connected. I think we all know this, but I think it was important to start with that. And so getting to the work at MCC, we really recognize that climate change and poverty and economic growth are, are absolutely linked. And that climate change actually directly impacts MCC's ability to deliver on our mission to reduce poverty through economic growth. And so we're planning to meet this moment, Sam, with determination, with ambition, and with humility, because we still have lots to learn. Um, and we know that we need to join hands with others if we're gonna have a chance of responding in a way that is robust enough and big enough to meet the immense scale of the challenge. So we moved very quickly at MCC. We immediately made climate change one of our top three strategic priorities for the next chapter of the agency, alongside inclusion and gender and catalyzing the private sector. Our goal is very clear. We want to partner with developing countries around the world to make climate smart investments that foster sustainable and inclusive growth. And that this is critical to building back from the ravages of COVID-19 and to help countries enhance the resilience to future climate uh, crises, adapt to new climate realities, reduce emissions and stimulate growth. We've got a strong foundation to build on. We've been a first mover in this area, even though we didn't always label our work as climate. Um, we scrubbed our portfolio um, in the past couple of weeks, and we identified that over the past five years, uh, we've inv uh, invested uh, $1.5 billion, or 38% of our program of funds, towards climate-related investments. And this is using the strict UNFCCC definition, um, to be clear. But we need to do more. And so to match the urgency of the challenge, Sam, and you're the first ones to hear this, we have decided to commit that more than 50% of our program funding over the next five years will be in climate related investments. How will we do this? We're taking an agency wide approach and we've worked on a new climate strategy that will expand and deepen our commitment to address climate change across our investment portfolio and business operations. So this concept of mainstreaming that no mentioned as part of the, the NGO compact really is relevant here. We have five main pillars quickly. The first one is to partner uh, with countries to invest in climate smart development and sustainable infrastructure. So we're gonna promote low carbon development, support countries to transition away from fossil fuels and maintain a coal free policy across our investment portfolio. We'll support countries efforts to meet their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. And we will integrate the needs of women and those most vulnerable to climate change in the design and implementation of our investments. Number two, we will press for key policy and institutional reforms and good governance to broaden the impact of our investments. So we'll advance policy and institutional reforms alongside sectorial master and investment planning to advance climate resilient, lower emissions development that supports partner countries as they define, hopefully strengthen, and of course, implement their NDCs. Uh, thirdly, we will strengthen the integration of climate and environmental considerations into our analytical tools and all of our decision making. So our economists are working really hard to fully integrate climate considerations into our policies, guidelines, into how we do constraints to growth analysis, how we do our cost benefit analysis um, through to design and implementation and evaluation. And here, I think a collaboration with economists across our institutions to bring the best and most recent knowledge about climate economics into our tools will be really important. Fourthly, we will expand and deepen partnerships and the use of blended finance to catalyze private capital for climate adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. I think that kind of financing is key. We need to crowd in essential private sector investments. And here, I'm looking at David, I'm looking at Michelle. We really want to work closely with our USG sister institutions, but also international partners. And then finally, and I think this is a point um, also that Noam, you made, 
we uh, want to seek innovative ways to reduce our own carbon footprint and to lead by our own example and to strengthen the resilience of our own operations. And so um, with nearly $520 million in programs expected to be signed in 2021 and up to 3.5 billion in MCC's pipeline, we think we're well positioned to make an impact um, in supporting partner countries towards sustainable climate, um, smart economic growth. And if you want to learn more about what we want to do, then I have time to say we've launched new climate pages on our, on our website today. And we encourage you to look at them and ask questions if you don't find the answers you're looking for on our web pages. Thanks, Sam. Well, thanks, Alexa, and really applaud MCC's big commitment to uh, run, you know, have a 50% uh, focus, uh, climate focus on your large portfolio. So really appreciate that commitment. And Michelle, turning to you, so, you know, AID has worked for addressing climate change throughout the last decade, and, and now we're in a period of this sort of renewed energy behind what you've been doing. Can you, you know, take a few minutes and tell us what you've seen at AID and how AID is gearing up to uh, deal with our climate crisis? So, sure, thank you, Sam, for um, the question. Thank you to this team for having all of us here today. I think this is a really important panel and I think um, I'm also really honored to be on such a distinguished panel with my colleagues from state and MCC, DFC. I will say we see each other quite often on screens. Um, and I think um, even, you know, we've been doing a lot of planning for the climate summit, laying out what our plans are as Alexia laid out MCCs. And, we're expecting that that collaboration will just increase and multiply as we think about implementation. Because at the end of the day, if we don't implement the plans and the goals, we're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and I just wanna maybe just say ditto to everything that Alexia said in terms of really connecting the fate of um, all of our work around development, the fate of the earth, the climate change, and needing to address climate change if we really wanna continue to be successful. USAID understands that and we, we know that this has got to be one of our key priorities and we've been making it that since we walked in the door. One thing I would say is that um, when we arrived at USAID, one of the nice surprises was that although the climate change programming had pretty much gone underground um, and was being done very much at the country level, it had not gone away because groups like yours and others had worked with Congress to maintain our ear, the earmarks on these programs. And I am not one, as all of you know, to applaud the use of earmarks, but it did really make a difference in terms of being, in terms of USA being able to continue a lot of this work um, and to also maintain some of the staffing levels. Um, but it was not ambitious. And so I think the difference that you will see in the coming months is really the level of ambition that USAID is going to demonstrate around this work. Um, we will be working with the interagency and with all of you on thinking about strategies and policies and developing those prior to COP. Um, we'll also be working with um, all, of our, all of our missions to ask them to look at their country development strategies, which sounds really dry, but we're asking them to look at their strategies and think about how can they expand their climate sensitive work but also how can they expand their direct climate change mitigation and adaptation programs? Um, we really wanna make sure that this is a priority and that it's being um, carried out in all of the missions around the world that are priorities. We're working closely with SPEC, look forward to hearing from Jonathan as, as he outlines what they've been doing to try to say how can USAID and, and um, state colleagues at POST work to um, move towards policy change through, and then also support that policy change through more and different um, foreign assistance. Um, one other thing I would just say is that we are going to be working, um, as Alexia said, to mainstream climate, climate change into all of our programs. You might most see this um, publicly in the work that we're doing with RFS. Um, RFS, uh, the, um, the Food Security Bureau, has brought on a senior advisor for climate change. Um, many of you might, will know Ann Vaughn, who came on to help them think about how do we integrate climate change considerations into our agriculture programs, our resilience programs, our clean water programs. It's very, very important. And we are working on doing that across some of the other bureaus. We just started the conversation more robustly with our global health colleagues and others. So look forward to um, updating you and working with you on all of that. Um, Finally, I would just say that we are going to be holding ourselves accountable to these new strategies and these contributions. We want to be part of the effort to meet the Paris Agreement goals, but we'll also be asking you and all of our partner countries to be part of that accountability. I want to applaud interaction for the, the climate compact that you all signed a year ago. I remember being in a room in Arizona where we talked about when I was a C 
a C, part of the CEO roundtable, what you guys are doing um, on your operation sides to, to meet some of those goals in that climate compact. So we are doing the same within USAID as we try to respond to the executive orders and some of the programming that's being put forward. So I'll stop there and look forward to further, being able to further outline what we're doing. Well, thank you, Michelle, and I appreciate uh, uh, how fast AID is moving on this. And turning to you, David, first, I want to thank you for uh, spending time to meet with staff of about 30 of our members and partners last week and to, to get their feedback on the DFC's development strategy and, and climate work. Um, but if you could go over some of the initiatives that the DFC is developing to address climate. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. It's delight. It's great to spend more time with Interaction. And let me just give a shout out to my uh, interagency colleagues. Um, so Jonathan has been the quarterback of the effort. Uh, we were at a very high level um, meeting at the White House yesterday, remotely, obviously, but Jonathan led the whole effort. He's done an amazing, amazing job. And one of the great things about this role um, is my, the opportunity to work with Alexia and Michelle and the others at MCC and, and USAID. We're, we're literally talk every day, coordinate, and uh, the DFC is only gonna be effective if we have close coordination and collaboration with MCC, USAID, and, and other agencies. And I think we're off to a good start and uh, we have more to do, but it's, it's been great. So um, uh, really enjoying that collaboration. Um, I would just start by saying that everything Alexia said, we agree with. Um, that she articulated the rationale that the president has said that, that climate change is the existential threat of our time. I think what you're gonna be seeing out of the White House and um, what Jonathan is doing is extraordinarily ambitious. Um, Jonathan probably won't say this, but he's basically coordinating, uh, let me rephrase that. Secretary Kerry and the White House are coordinating with Jonathan's help, uh, perhaps the most important meeting uh, on climate ever. Um, and so I just think what they're doing and the leadership the president is providing, Secretary Kerry, it's extraordinary, it's motivating. And, um, you know, again, reflecting on this meeting we had yesterday where we went over our final plans, I was just, I'm privileged to be in the room and be part of this because what you're gonna see is very, very ambitious. Um, the DFC also has an ambitious program. I am a little <clears throat> tied up because a bunch of what we're gonna do is the president and the White House gonna announce tomorrow. So I can't really um, say everything, but let me just say that what you'll see from the DFC is the most ambitious climate agenda of any DFI in the G7 and the G20, um, both in terms of our goals, our um, objectives, and what we're gonna do. And let me just highlight a few things that, that you'll see without getting into specifics so I don't get fired. Um, so um, you will see that we will be adopting a net zero objective, which is faster and more ambitious than any DFI anywhere in the G20, G7. You'll see a very, very high level of targeting for our investments uh, that will have a climate link, not just mitigation, and but also adaptation. Um, the DFC has done a lot in renewables for years uh, under in OPIC as well. Uh, if you look at our portfolio, we have about $31 billion of assets under management and about a third of that is energy. And in that energy bucket, about half is carbon. I think you'll see a significant, significant shift in our portfolio over the coming years. Um, we will announce shortly that we were, are going to hire our first and appoint our first chief climate officer at the DFC. And actually, we got such spectacular um, applications and such a large pool that we said, we got to hire two of them. And so we're going to have a chief and a deputy. So um, we're just finalizing the vetting on those folks, um, but they're really extraordinary. And I'm hopeful that we can get those announcements out shortly. Um, we're going to create a technical assistance facility um, with a significant amount of money to, to, for grants in driving uh, technical assistance and feasibility studies. Um, yesterday, we put out the agency's first ever call for proposals for private equity, growth, venture capital, real estate, and infrastructure funds with a climate focus. 
it's going to be a continuous call that we hopefully we can uh, fund for many, many years in the future. But we hope to allocate a significant amount of our new equity authority under the DFC towards funds that have a climate focus. Um, and I'm very excited about that. And I'm hopeful we see a lot of applications. Um, last week, in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation, we announced the first ever call for distributive renewable energy projects. Uh, we have a goal to really drive activity in that market. It's a very, very hard market. It has not developed as much as, as any of us would like, but we wanna use our funds to be a catalyst. And we're partnering with the Rockefeller Foundation, also the Shell Foundation to drive activity in that space. And then consistent with um, Alexia, you know, we will be rolling out um, in the next few months, actually, we wanna consult with Interaction and your members uh, as part of this process. So I think it'll be a several month effort. But basically the, the DFC, as you know, was what really started a year and change ago. The legislation passed in 2018, but, but we really called January 1st of 20 as year one. Uh, Andy Herskowitz, our chief development officer, led an effort working closely with uh, Interaction to deliver the first ever um, development strategy, which we called the Roadmap for the Future. Uh, the interac interaction provided a very, very significant you know, shaping of that. Um, there was one thing missing in that um, development strategy, the word climate. So uh, when we roll out the updated development strategy, you will notice a change. And um, so climate will be at the center of our strategy. Um, and so I'll stop there and we're just really excited. We have great announcements coming tomorrow. And I think you'll see the DFC really leading the charge and pu pushing the envelope in terms of ambition with respect to uh, climate. So I'll stop there. Thanks again. Well, thank you, David. And we look forward to the DFC's uh, announcements uh, tomorrow. Um, and now turning to you, Jonathan, as you know, your office and the, and the role of Special Presidential Envoy Kerry, you know, as we've all noted here, are, are essential for this uh, global political strategy that we're, you know, we see is requiring you know, really aggressive strides towards climate mitigation. And at the same time, we're witnessing already uh, uh, the impact of climate on so many globally. And, you know, a sense of how your office is trying to balance these sort of political mitigation needs and to integrate the perspective of frontline communities into policy making uh, when you face all these competing demands. And uh, again, thank you again for being with us. So thanks very much, Sam. And Noam, I really appreciate the chance to, to be here with you all uh, and following up on what Alexia and Michelle and, and David just said. Uh, there's a great deal going on in the administration. I think you're hearing just a, a little bit of it. One of the things that's really exciting about the summit that's coming up is it will be a chance for us to showcase the really large uh, whole of government effort that's underway. There is really no department or agency that is not doing something on this agenda. And I think it just echoes the point that's been made. This is really quite a central component of the president's uh, plan. This is what he really wants to deliver on. He's made it one of the top themes in the government. It translates into pretty much every single activity that we're undertaking. I wanted to say just a few words about a couple of pieces of it, though, that, that maybe uh, focus more on the conversation we're having here. The first, as you've noted, is the role that Secretary Kerry is playing, and a number of us trying to support him in that endeavor. Uh, this is the first time we've ever had an appointment at this level in the United States government. Uh, he reports to the president. Uh, he sits on the National Security Council. Uh, as you know, he's got enormous standing, having served earlier as both Secretary of State and prior to that as Chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, uh, as well as being a presidential uh, candidate himself. He opens doors around the world. Uh, and like uh, you think about your Rolodex and his Rolodex, he, he actually talks to the head of state wherever he wants to go. And it really has made a remarkable uh, ability and elevated our capacity to engage. Um, the office is new. It's sitting uh, across between the State Department and the White House, so it has this very interesting structure. We've been working a lot with Gina McCarthy's team that's working on the domestic plan, but we've also been working with the larger interagency group as it thinks about the development and design of international policy. So why does that matter? Well, the U.S. is about 13% of global emissions. 
So when you think about the solution, you've got to figure out where the other 87% is going to go. And that really means a global endeavor. At the same time, the U.S. has, give or take, some about 230 million people, and the world in its multiple billions is where the impact's going to lie. And we have the resources and the capacity to address some of those really difficult and, and in some cases, existential impacts. Others are much, much less able, much less fortunate in terms of their capacity, their resources, their technological abilities, and the United States is in a position to, to help with that. And so we see these as two significant components of the agenda. In some ways, this is laid out pretty nicely in the summit, which will be held tomorrow and Friday. Uh, we're setting it up over two days, largely because of time zone constraints. Uh, you can often bring people together for one day wherever you are in the world. In this instance, it, it doesn't work so well to have an afternoon meeting for anybody in Asia. Uh, the morning is a better opportunity. And even then, people are being remarkably generous with their time and coming in the middle of the night in some cases to participate. Uh, we've invited 40 heads of state, and they are all coming. So I think it speaks volumes to both the interest in the agenda and the discussion, but also I think significant hope that the U.S. with its re-entry into the global conversation will be in a position to help facilitate next steps that are really essential. I want to speak about it because it really highlights what we see as the agenda and how we are approaching the problem, because we've structured the meeting very much in the context of how we see solutions. So the first one is essentially a reconvening of the major economies. If we think about the larger climate problem, unless we can mitigate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a global level, we will not be successful. If you look at the largest 20 nations in terms of their economies and their emissions, they're responsible for about 75 to 80 percent of the global total. So it's a manageable cohort. It's a group you can convene. It comes under the guise for us of the major economies forum, but in a variant, it's actually the G20 as well. So you think about this structure and they're the opening framing. But it's very clear that they do not reflect a much larger population pool or a very large population pool of those who are not responsible for the problem, but will bear the brunt of the consequences. So in this same first session, we are seeking to expand and elaborate and have voices from others who are seeing the effects that they didn't really contribute to. They're bearing the burden. And that includes countries like Bangladesh, currently chair of the V20, which is the vulnerable countries, a group of more than 20 actually, vulnerable countries, but Bangladesh leads. It brings us some of the small island states who are existentially threatened by the climate framework. We want those voices to be raised and to have these major economies who are responsible hear from those who are seeing the consequences firsthand. I don't minimize the consequences from the large players. If I'm in India uh, looking at the con consequences to my coastal zones, they're devastating. So it's not that they don't see them, but there's a different perspective often that comes from these other nations that we really want to bring to the table. The second conversation is going to be focused on finance. And the reason to think about this is really to think through some of the things that Dave raised, that Alexia raised, uh, we're doing with the USAID community. Uh, it's part and parcel of a larger effort to think about two parts of the agenda. The first is that under the Paris Agreement, we all committed to try to mobilize $100 billion per year in climate-related finance. That was considered to be a combination of public and private activity. It's not to pay for, it's to mobilize. We're falling a bit short. In our intention, you've seen some of the releases in the skinny budget that's come out. We are intending to really increase our revenues uh, to support our commitments to go back and take a look at the fact that the last four years were not a good place for the United States or for the world to be, really to try to elevate that. But it's also part of a conversation we're having with the global international institutions, the World Bank, the uh, IFC, the discussions in the Asia and the Africa Development Banks, the conversations that deal with development assistance and finance at the bilateral level across and around the world. That's the first bucket. But there's a second bucket, and we wanted to really elevate that in the context of this conversation. And that's work that we've been doing and Secretary Kerry has really been leading on, which is to drive the private sector financial community to this conversation. It's not really $100 billion that we need. It's a trillion dollars. Maybe it's $2 trillion. It's reorienting existing investment, and it's finding new investment at scale. 
And that's going to bring a rather different constituency to the table. That brings a combination of the world's largest banks, the asset owners. It brings the pension and insurance funds. It brings the sovereign wealth funds. That group can mobilize a trillion dollars at a time. Some of the largest institutions that are out there have more than a trillion dollars single-handedly of assets under management, and those need to be redirected. This conversation will elevate that discussion. And that discussion has been easiest in some ways in things that are commercial. It's pretty straightforward to say it is no longer an economically viable proposition to invest in coal because there are other cheaper options. But what do you do when the investment has to be in infrastructure? How do you think about it when the investment is in adaptation capacity? We need to find ways to move the private financial community into that. And both the work that Alexia is doing, the work that Dave's doing, and Michelle, that is driving that discussion. And we want to bring this larger financial wherewithal to the table. We're having a conversation on innovation. From the way we see it, the conversation is inadequate. The discussions so far indicate that while we know how to do many things, many of them are too expensive. We need to find innovative solutions to drive prices down, to make it open and possible to engage and invest in new options. The straightforward ones are things like battery technology. We understand that. We know where it goes. But it has to be brought down in price to make it viable for reliable electricity as well as for electric vehicles. Others are harder. What are we doing with things like the agricultural sector? What are the innovations in soil carbon management that really would matter to agricultural productivity, not in a place like the US, which can move it quickly, but in places like Kenya, which really could use it and need to have that technology made available and localized and relevant to their circumstances. And then we get to the things that are further off, but are almost certainly going to be essential. How do you start taking carbon out of the atmosphere? We're going to have to do that. And that price has got to come down. And then we'll close with a session on jobs and the transition. As we look at this, this is at the heart of the president's agenda. He's made very clear the climate agenda is essentially an economics and jobs agenda. This is a transition we're going to make. If we do it right, there's an enormous opportunity. And it's an opportunity not just for Americans, it's an opportunity globally. It's an opportunity in new technologies, in better air quality, in better urban living, in programs that protect and preserve biodiversity. This is an enormous window for collective global growth, and we want to incent that. We'll have a series of additional sessions that will delve more deeply into four other issues. One is going to be on the land and the nature-based solutions. We see this as central. 30%, give or take some, of global emissions come from nature, from agriculture, from deforestation. Can we do a better job managing that? It's often in subsistence economies that, that the impact will be felt. How do we mitigate those risks? How do we think about managing it for people who are living at the edge of agricultural sustainability and now are threatened by increased drought, increased floods, sea level rise, temperature, salt incursion? We need that work. We also are looking at uh, issues around, uh, around adaptation. And this for us has been a very central play. As we think about this, all of it permeates the discussion. So adaptation shows up in multiple places, but there's gonna be a separate pullout explicitly looking at adaptation and resilience. How do we elevate this agenda? We see it as absolutely essential. Even if we are successful in driving the global temperatures to only down to a degree and a half of warming, the impacts are ferocious. If we get higher than that, they're much, much worse still. And the impacts are disproportionately felt by the poorest and the already most vulnerable. How do we drive that agenda forward? We're ourselves working on our own adaptation plans. That'll be a national measure, but we're also trying through AID and others to support a global agreement. And then finally, we're trying to put the subnational players at the table, bring these other voices. This is not exclusively a conversation that speaks only to national governments. Cities matter, communities matter, local voices matter. How do we get them to the table and elevate it? Throughout, we're gonna have some other people coming. We have NGO and civil society voices. We have youth voices. We have indigenous voices. These are ones that we're trying to bring out because they actually give us both solutions and reflect back to us needs and where we have to take it.
So state's leading on this, but it's a global exercise across the government. We've tapped into all of the agencies, technical agencies, international agencies. We're driving conversations with key partners. You may have seen the statement that just came out from China. We were there recently. We've been to the Middle East and had a conversation with partners that you don't often associate with solutions, but they've got real answers. Places like Saudi Arabia making major investments in solar. We've been to India and had some conversations there. We're in Bangladesh. We spent some time in Europe. And then we're doing dozens and dozens of high-level calls. The president with heads of state, Secretary Kerry, sometimes with heads of state, sometimes with foreign ministers, climate leaders around the world. This is an agenda that we're really trying to push forward because this is a year that we really have to see a transition. And the summit, we hope, in the next couple of days will kick that off. So thanks very much, Sam, and happy to take on questions come along. Thanks. So th thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for a very thorough overview of, of this upcoming uh, summit and for your leadership and the clear U.S. government leadership in this area. And a part of the, the you know, U.S. Leaders Climate Summit is, is as you've mentioned, to engage uh, non-state actors who have committed to a green recovery and and we all have sort of this equitable vision of limiting a warming to 1.5 under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, we have on this call, I think it's 60 or so uh, NGOs represented here. Uh, maybe starting with you, what role do you think that you see as uh, in essence the development NGO community uh, play uh, in supporting this broader agenda you so nicely laid out for us? So Jonathan, you can answer that first. So thanks very much. I had the, the really good fortune of spending the last four years uh, as, the, as the head of a program looking exactly at these kinds of questions at the Hewlett Foundation. And one of the things that I am struck by is how essential that voice is. As I come back into government, um, and I've been in and out of government a number of times, what I find incredibly valuable are the insights that I've taken from those last four years. I just wanna make a couple of high level points about things that I'm seeing and opportunities. The first one is that civil society is in, an essential partner in pretty much every single government. It plays out differently in place to place. Sometimes it's been extremely difficult. I look at some of the dynamics in Brazil right now and I think about the difficulty people there are having. Nonetheless, that voice is, is raised and you see it and you see its consequence. You see it in Europe, where the youth community has really been a central partner, not just a, a, you know, a, a star like a Greta Thunberg, but the much larger cohort, the numbers of people who turn out in things like the Extinction Rebellion, who stand on the streets and provide a moral vision of what we have to do and hold leaders to account in extraordinarily important frames. But then I look at the places that we've also tried to invest, and they speak to a different part of civil society. They speak to the ideas that are generated by our think tanks and our academics. And I look at a place like China and the work that it is doing, and the scenarios that China has been developing to get to net zero are coming from places like Tsinghua University. They're coming from resources like the NGO community there that works on the think tanks. These are ideas that are certainly shared widely, but they're inserted into a policy process that's making an incredible difference. And then I think about how we actually have to implement and where does it go when you get to the ground? Because ultimately what government does is does policy frameworks. And what companies do is they decide where they're going to invest, partly in the context of the policy. But a great deal is what people choose to do. It's what happens on the ground. What purchase uses you choose to make? Where do you live? How do you commute? What kinds of lands do you wanna see in your neighborhood? How do you stand up and make those things happen? And that's a grassroots program that comes from every single one of the people on this screen, all of you working in individual places. Ultimately, it has to come from the bottom up. If people don't make the case that this is a problem, governments won't act accordingly and society won't move adequately. So I see this as every single scale every single level, engagement from a very intellectual and highbrow frame to a very pragmatic and operational context. It has to be global. It is insufficient to work only in the US. It does matter what Kenya does. It matters what South Africa does. If I look at what's going on in Chad, it plays out as it plays out in Pakistan and Oman and places in between. We have to get this right globally. 
There are not players who can sit on the sidelines and say it's someone else's problem. If they do that, we will fail. And this community and this cohort can drive that outcome. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And turning to Michelle asking the same question again, sort of a challenge back to this community of what we could do uh, from AID's perspective to move this agenda forward. Sam, I wanna say thank you. And I also wanna say thank you to Jonathan for laying out what we're doing and, and really um, summarizing the, the US commitment. I think um, someone in the chat had mentioned that it was palpable to feel the difference. And I just will say that the energy that Jonathan and the SPEC team and the former secretary Kerry have has just been inf in, uh, infectious and we all feel the same way. I think um, this event is a really good example of how we wanna start to work with the NGO community, having kind of a broad based conversation and then going deep on some of the technical issues around adaptation, around resilience, around clean energy work, around kind of how you build the capacity, not just to do the work, but then to uptake as uh, Jonathan said, some of the changes. I think um, I wanna thank uh, Interaction for your paper and we look forward to discussing those with you around adaptation. It's a really important, important work. We are already, um, we just yesterday, we're talking about a USAID engagement strategy with our partners to um, seek your guidance, seek your wisdom. Um, and that will be uh, rolling out in the next couple of months through DDI and the Bureau for uh, Food Security. So please look, look to that. Um, we are looking for all kinds of um, all kinds of ideas. And we also wanna to talk to you about how to reach civil society on the ground in the countries where you're working, because we appreciate the conversation with you, but ultimately as Jonathan was laying out and my colleagues were laying out, it's the change in those countries it has to be um, accepted, has to be part of their DNA, has to be something that is really relevant to the local context. So we'll be asking you for that help and you know, state USAID and others are really well positioned, MCC and DFC, because we have people on the ground, we all do in different ways and different capacities to have those conversations, both here in Washington, in international capitals, but also on, and also in the, on the ground in the countries where we work. Um, I would just say that we um, really look forward also to talking to you um, as I said before at this top of the session around your climate compact and what you are doing in your operations to reach kind of to, to reach net zero goals and how can we as USAID as a contractor with you um, help you achieve those goals more quickly and learn from you as well because the EOs urge USAID also to, to change the way it operates. So we look forward to all of those conversations. Well, thanks, Michelle. And, and turning to David, we've been working very closely, obviously, with DFC. Any, any reflections from where you sit on uh, what NGOs could do here? Well, yeah, thank you very much. You know, we're just very focused on projects and putting money to work and investments. And we work with NGOs all the time. We have partnerships with lots of NGOs for microfinance. We have a blended finance approach that we can work with NGOs. So, you know, we would be very, very enthusiastic to work with some of your members on partnerships where we can deploy capital to drive our climate objectives with you all. And so, you know, Jim Polin is probably the right person at the DFC to, that would lead this effort. Um, but we would be interested in partnering with NGOs around the world and in developing countries, particularly in low income and lower middle income countries um, to drive our climate agenda. And we, I mean, that's basically it is, is we want to deploy capital in this space. And that often happens with private sector entities and often happens with NGOs. Well, thank you, David. And Alexia, to end with you here uh, again, on sort of a focus on, uh, MCC's engagement of civil society and NGOs. Thanks, Sam. So clearly you have a, the NGOs have a hugely important role to play in the green recovery and the equitable, the equitable green recovery. And I think Jonathan's comment of the highbrow intellectual to the grassroots implementation really resonates um, well with me. And, and when I think about it, Sam, I think there's at least three roles um, you know, for NGOs in this space. And obviously you're not a homogeneous group, right? Um, but there's the role of accountability, the sort of expertise slash ideas piece, and then the inclusion piece, the really getting the voices, the local voices included um, would be three of the big roles that, that we see. I, so I think with respect to you know, expertise and inclusion, for example, you know, MCC really leverages the knowledge, the networks of local NGOs, that was Michelle's point as well, um, in partner countries that you all have and that we need 
throughout design, implementation, and evaluation. So throughout our entire uh, program uh, cycle, you know, and so during our, we need to do extensive consultations uh, with CSOs. Um, and as you know, everything we do at MCC starts with the uh, constraints analysis and involving um, CSOs to help us understand the binding constraints in countries is, is critical. And that then drives everything else um, that we do. Um, then accountability is another space that's really important, um, providing oversight and holding donors, development institutions, governments accountable. This week, there'll be a ton of commitments made um, and holding us all to account that these commitments translate um, into, into real delivery, I think is certainly a big role. Um, and then if I think of, of MCC in terms of governance, um, NGOs play a really important role with respect to the accountable entities that um, we have in each of our partner countries, what we call MCAs. They're the ones that are actually managing the day-to-day -day programs that we have in countries. And on the board of directors of these accountable entities in each of our countries that we work in, we have civil society on those boards, both providing that accountability and oversight role, but also having that sort of information advocacy role in terms of you know, really um, um, letting the, the broad range of stakeholders in the countries know what we're trying to do and getting feedback um, uh, to us. I think it's clear to be, to be frank that there's more that we can do, should do, uh, both with international NGOs and local NGOs in each of these three areas um, that I mentioned in order to really accelerate success on our climate ambition. And I'd love to hear more from you also on your feedback to us. Um, but I think, you know, again, really the, the, the voice of, of local communities is gonna be critical to the questions of sustainability. And I think there's a huge, we could do more in this area to work with you, work with your local partners to really um, um, uh, make sure that our projects are targeting local communities, the poor, the most marginalized and really integrating them into our thinking. So I think that's a very concrete area. Um, I think community partnership is gonna be essential to everything we do. I think you mentioned the challenge of agriculture, Jonathan. And if we think about the reality of some agricultural practices that will have to change just because the weather patterns will not support them. How do you have communities embrace those changes and see them as something that's good and viable for them? And how do you work with them to sort of build that knowledge together, I think is, is another sort of really critical area. And I think there are instances we do less in this space. I wanna be you know, honest, but I think there are also instances because of the expertise piece where um, NGOs can be important implementation partners to us. We don't have a ton of, of examples, but we do have some good ones, including, for example, in Malawi, in Indonesia, where we gave grants to local institutions, 52 grants to really work on issues of, of uh, small scale renewable energy, ec women's economic empowerment, sustainable agriculture, peatland management, and social forestry. Um, let me stop there. Well, thank you all for, especially for this challenge to our community here. We've heard this great, big, broad vision that Jonathan has so nicely said. I understand Jonathan is going to have to drop off and really appreciate the, the hour you've given us here uh, and wish you uh, good luck tomorrow. Uh, and do count on us uh, both to step up for you, but also to support the efforts uh, and to, to pay close attention to all those commitments that are being made so that we can play our role uh, in stepping up ourselves. So thank you, Jonathan, for, for joining us and good luck tomorrow. And to so all three of you, just thanks for this push for our community that we, we need to step up in our own uh, carbon footprint, our own ability to adapt our own programs, uh, this whole broad focus on what is local and getting local voices and local power uh, and local capacity involved uh, and, uh, and our stepping up of our advocacy as we do this. I'm not gonna, uh, shift here uh, and uh, get some remarks in response to the panel. And we have uh, two, two speakers who have uh, decided to, uh, will step into this role. And the first one is Abby Maxson, who is the president and CEO of Vox America. Uh, give us some brief uh, comments now. Thank you, uh, Sam, and uh, for organizing us and to all the panelists for being here. And I, I really think I speak for every single one of us of being incredibly inspired but we, what, by what we heard today uh, from each of the panelists and of course the agencies they represent and the administration's whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis and truly how essential it is that this approach extends development assistance to support vulnerable communities across the world to adapt to the impacts of climate change. 
you know, we all know, we, it, we're, we all agree that the world's poorest are the most vulnerable to these devastating impacts of climate change. And the group of US agencies that are playing such a critical role and providing foreign assistance that take into consideration the consequences, the climate consequences on those who suffer most. So it's just been truly great to see and hear the ambition from each of the agencies and the speakers and we welcome a number of the commitments around collaboration, coherence and coordination in ways that truly center the voices and perspectives and human rights of frontline communities, especially women and the most marginalized. And it was terrific to hear that hope and hard work are back, Alexia, thank you. It's, it's palpable and we appreciate the ambitious goals and ambitious being an operative word, the commitment to coordination, the clear KPIs you've laid out and the accountabilities. And it's great to hear the recognition of the critical role of activists in civil society at all levels. And that today we're coming together, bringing our collective commitment. We all have accountabilities to making this meaningful progress and reverse the negative trajectory and doing everything we can, as you all have said so well, to meet the moment and the immense scale of the challenge. Uh, we're really pleased to hear the recognition of the how crucial cross-agency commitment is to aligning foreign policy goals and delivering development results that will really address the climate crisis at this time, at this moment. Now, I know we welcome all of the uh, Biden administration's new initiatives and know and I hear that how well positioned we all are to support you and each other as we undertake uh, our efforts on, on this topic. But you know, there's a number of central strategies that we are really ready to support. Um, certainly the strategy com considerations and program recommendations to assist USAID in the new interaction report. Uh, Michelle, thanks for flagging the interest there and uh, the USAID climate adaptation and integration the creation of a team of climate adaptation professionals across all levels of the federal government whose full-time job is to facilitate cross-agency climate resilience planning and projects at all levels, uh, legislation to establish a global climate change resilience strategy that promotes coordination amongst agencies and the commitments to mitigate the impacts of climate change on displacement and humanitarian emergencies, and really welcoming the administration's efforts to end US international public finance for fossil fuels across bilateral and multilateral institutions, because we know we must also address the root causes of the climate crisis in order to reduce the suffering being experienced by the most vulnerable communities. Uh, and I really, I, I know we all look forward to the agencies adopting even more ambitious commitments to supporting a just transition away from fossil fuels and the support for workers and communities affected during that transition. Uh, I know I don't only speak be on behalf of Oxfam, uh, that e all of us in the interaction community are prioritizing our internal accountabilities around this effort. Yeah. I know at Oxfam, we're revamping our internal strategy to prioritize and integrate climate change across the organization. We're grounding this in feminist, racial justice, and community ownership principles, and ensuring that our strategy challenges us to address the impacts of climate change on the world's most vulnerable communities while pushing for those who are most capable to addressing the climate crisis first and most ambitiously through urgent emission reductions and scaled up international climate finance. Uh, so we're all working hard together uh, in, in our own organizations and ready to support each of you. Before I wrap up, I want to underscore the importance as Jonathan and, and Alexia and others have said of the strong and effective partnership between civil society, local, national, international and government. I appreciated the reference also to the private sector, but the role and partnership with civil society is key certainly in the aftermath of the Trump administration's severe cuts to climate-focused programming. We know civil society was key to ensuring that climate work continued. And as the Biden administration begins prioritizing climate, civil society actors are key to supporting your agencies and scaling up climate programming and holding them accountable for delivering results. I also wanna highlight how important it is protecting civic space. It's been under assault and further constrained during COVID. And that's really key. And I count on all of us and, and the administration's support in that 
endeavor, investing in protecting and supporting local leadership and partnership with local actors is crucial. And civil society can support uh, USAID and others shifting ownership and decision-making to those closest to the issues. You know, as, as Noam noted in his opening, civil society continues to play a critical role in amplifying the voices of those who are most impacted by the climate crisis, especially women and marginalized communities, keeping local, national NGOs, women's rights organizations and voices at the center to our efforts and our essential parts of the solution. So we are just thrilled to be here today together celebrating the one year anniversary of the NGO Climate Compact. We are a proud and passionate signatory of it as Oxfam as the other 89 agencies who've signed on and being together on the one year anniversary uh, coinciding with Earth Day, the Leaders Climate Summit, providing this really essential opportunity to reflect not only on the progress we've made but the true work that lies ahead as we continue to implement the climate compact and tackle the, the climate crisis. So look forward to the discussion ahead and thank you, count on our partnership, we are here. Well, thank you, Abby, thank you very much for your comments. And I'm gonna turn it now to Ambassador Daniel Speckert, uh, who is the president and CEO of Forest International. And Daniel, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and I really do wanna thank uh, Alexia, uh, David, uh, Michelle and Jonathan for having joined us today. I, having done three years of public service myself, I am gone through six presidential transitions. I kind of know the situation you're in right now. And it's not one where you have a lot of free time to go out and focus on external uh, engagement. You are buried, I'm sure, in getting all these plans together, ready, uh, ready to appear in front of the White House, in front of Congress, and in front of us and the public. And so your willingness to come here today is just, in my mind, really impressive at your level. So thank you for that. And thanks, Sam, for Interaction, for organizing this and bringing us all together around the Climate Compact. I think Sam may have offered me the chance to say a few words today because we at Chorus are trying to think differently about this as we are everything else. We are uh, a family essentially of mid-sized uh, NGOs and for-profit organizations that have come together in a formal structure to increase our impact in the world. One of those areas is climate, right? Uh, we have been involved in climate adaptation for years, uh, doing some interesting programming like between the trans-border stuff between India and Nepal, but we also understand that uh, we're not the experts in this area, right? Uh, and I think the challenge that you're seeing today and what you're hearing from us is that we are falling in line with what President Biden has said and what we have already come to the conclusions ourselves as a group that climate is the existential issue of our age. And no matter what you're working on, no matter what our specialty in any of our NGOs, we don't have the luxury of saying, we're gonna leave it to the environmental NGOs to solve this problem while we go ahead and solve our poverty issues, our uh, social justice issues, our uh, um, uh, health issues and so forth. And so we're here, we are your soldiers on the ground around the world and here in the United States. I would expect that we probably have constituents in every county in this country. Uh, and we probably have offices and just about um, as a group in every country overseas. And, um, engaging at all levels is what I heard you talking about. And I'm thinking we're gonna be a really good partner for you in that. I love the way that you guys are coming together across agencies as well, because that's what's gonna to have to happen. And if you kind of stove pipe us across agencies and we kind of try to match all the different things, it's gonna to be tough. A little bit about that is gonna be the devils in the details. The more you can make not just the policy coherent, but the practices of how you engage us, the policies that you inflict upon us uh, and the uh, restrictions that you want uh, us to follow. And if they're more coherent across agencies, it will make our life easier. I have five points that I want to draw out. Many of these come from the strategy uh, that I, I know you talked about and many of you've already highlighted, but let me just go through them quickly. One is we're not starting from scratch. This is, I think, something I hope you'll think about. COVID showed us that we can pivot from using existing platforms that are already out there 
to engage on a global crisis, right? And so you saw all of our organizations pivoting. And in our case, we were in working large government USDA projects like Sesame and, and Burkina Faso. We used those communication channels, that social capital we had and everything else to start commuting health issues. It wasn't part of the grant, wasn't part of the proposal, but we knew the crisis demanded that great infrastructure. And I'm sure this whole group around you today has that kind of infrastructure out there to be able uh, to engage that. So we don't, and everything doesn't need to be a new bespoke project. Could you encourage you to think about what you already have in the pipeline, what we're already doing, and how you can use food aid projects, uh, poverty projects, health projects, other kinds of projects to say, where is that how do we use that social capital, those networks, that infrastructure, those people, uh, and that reach now for this environmental issue as well? And how do we add on to what we're already doing rather than just starting a whole new uh, stovepipe of the environmental work? Second, uh, needs to, we need to make it local. I heard a lot of you talking about this already, but again, in my government experience, I worked as a, on the Sherpa teams for many G7 issues and so forth. You guys are gonna do a fantastic job. Listening to Jonathan just warms my heart. This is exciting. I mean, you guys have your act together in such a short time. It's gonna be exciting to see what you think. But the transmission from those summits to what happens at the very grassroots level or from what even what happens from heads of states in these countries down to the grassroots level is a long road. And so I'm excited to hear you talking about bringing local voices and building local ownership uh, in these processes. I would argue just please that it's not just bringing these people to the table. What we've learned in development practice, it's about allowing them to build their own locally led adaptive uh, work as they solve these problems. So they're not just speaking up at your parties, you need to go to their parties and let them tell you what they're gonna do and come in and reinforce them. Third, we need a diverse set of partners and tools to have sustainable results. I love listening to you, Alexia and David, because I know you're gonna bring the corporate world to the table. You speak their language, you know how to make that happen. And what we understand, I think as NGOs, that you probably wouldn't have heard 10, 20 years ago, where we did have a lot of suspicion about that corporate world, just give us some money, we'll solve this problem ourselves. I think you're gonna see this group is really open to understanding that we can't do this by ourselves and especially this environmental problem. We're here ready to work with anybody that you wanna help us work with to be partners in this stuff. And the tools that we're gonna need like blended finance, carbon offsets, and all these other new creative ideas coming to the table that are different and unusual, we're ready for those. Your challenge is gonna be able to allow that to happen, especially like Michelle, you and USAID, you know, or structures of all this kind of strange stuff, uh, get your contracting officers nervous, your procurement officers nervous, uh, your um, ability to get the right metrics in place and so forth. But that nimbleness, willingness to try, fail and try again is gonna be part of the key for this. And I need to encourage our government partners to be really flexible. Fourth, we need to recognize that the clarion call of our time is not just environment, it's social justice. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat it here, but the poor being hurt the worst uh, and the least able to withstand the impacts. But I can say, I'm glad I heard you guys say it today. And I think we're all gonna want the administration to be saying it over and over and louder and louder, and we will come in behind you on that. We need to avoid being paternalistic when we do this. We need to actually bring their voices into this table as well, which you talked about. Which brings me to my last point. Um, my 40 years in international affairs has led me to one overarching lesson learned. The rest, I'm still lost, right? Uh, you, you, the older you get, the less you know. This is one thing I think I really learned. The solution to these global challenges is not a project, right? And in my government experience, in my NGO experience, my private experience, we tend to projectize things. It's about relationships. And in this case, it's about a relationship to our planet, and it's about our relationship to each other across the planet in terms of the community of people, of brothers and sisters. We need to get those relationships right. Uh, and if we do it right, 
uh, then the projects will show fruit. If we don't worry about the relationships, we'll have failed projects, wasted resources, and ineffective laws and frameworks. And I think partly I also represent some of the faith-based organizations at this table. And I can tell you that brings bringing that also that idea of relationships and love for brother and sister is a really powerful thing. And some of us have the, uh, both the honor and the really challenging uh, privilege of representing people across the political spectrum, right? And so I have, and people who support our organizations, people who watch Fox News and MSNBC and PBS and BBC, and they come at this from all different angles, but that faith element of why we're doing this about love for neighbor and service to others and what it means to be in relationship in harmony in our world, is a powerful message I think that we, I hope the administration will also tap into. So uh, thanks for that opportunity to speak. I hope I did a halfway decent job of representing what a really broad community here as we start to speak. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Abby. We have a number of questions up. I know uh, two or a couple of organizations already sent some in earlier. So I'll, I'll do, see if we get two questions in here. And I, and I note that uh, David's probably gonna have to leave us in about 10 minutes or so before we wrap this up. But Yanti, uh, sorry, I'd say the children. Yanti, I know you had to end with a question if you could get one in and then I'll be turning to Katie Taylor from uh, Pan American Development Foundation. Thanks, Sam, and, and wonderful to, to see you all uh, in some cases again, and, and super impressive to see this engagement from this administration and so coherent as well. It's uh, anyway, it's a joy and people have said it. So let me add to that. My question, and I actually, I sort of, Changed my mind because there's so there's been so much talk about the most vulnerable populations and clearly Save the Children is incredibly concerned about particularly the intergenerational justice aspect of this. Kids and and young people um, have not caused it, have quite often um, uh, li limited resources and are certainly bearing the brunt of all of this. But my question is more about to to Daniel's earlier point about mechanisms and how do we make it easier for us to, to be able to respond to literally current unfolding famine in, in across or severe food insecure, increased food insecurity, partly because of climate change in, in roughly 20 hotspots around the world where we have to act now in order to really prevent dire, dire consequences versus how do we make sure we also do that sustainably? And quite often the mechanisms that we still have our at our disposal from particularly uh, institutional donors like USAID are sometimes not at, at all there because we have different uh, mechanisms and, and in some cases we're actually being asked to be less sustainable because that's how the mechanism, mechanisms were put in place uh, you know, at, at a certain point in time. So it'd be, I would really, and I know you know this, Michelle, I'm sure, but I, you know, I would really like to stress that that is, it, you know, we, there's a lot of things we can actually do e even um, outside of the innovation piece to make that easier for ourselves. Um, so uh, maybe not a question, but more of a, a, a reminder of um, the importance of that if we really want to make it practical and uh, impactful on the ground. Michelle, any reflections on this? So I would just say, Jonty, thank you so much for the question. And I think um, this actually goes back for me to something that we were just talking about. Um, in terms of integrating climate change into all of our programming. And I think in the past, we had really thought about climate change as kind of as one of our silos. And we were not thinking about how do we change and how do we do our agriculture program in a sustainable way? How do we do our education program in a sustainable way? How do we do our humanitarian assistance in a more sustainable way? So I think that is one of the challenges that we have. And I think we talk a lot in our community um, and I did when I was in government and when I was out of government about integrating issues into um, other issues. And I think we're thinking about how do you do that in a real way and not just say we're doing it. Um, and so we would welcome some dialogue with you all about how we, we work across programs to integrate key issues. The other thing I would say that's really exciting to me is that we are actually working it's kind of a, it was a triumvirate of ourselves, RFS and DDI working on climate change at first. And within about a week, BHA came to the table and said, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and said, hey, we want to be part of this conversation as well. And we know we've often not been part of it because it's been a little bit scary for us to think about bringing climate change into our programs, whether that's in the immediate disaster response or in some of our other more development oriented 
um, Nexus programs, but they're right now at the table with us as well and thinking about the sustainability question and how to do their programs in the most, um, in a more friendly way to the climate. There are a lot of trade-offs when you're thinking about this work. And so we need to be clear about which one has the priority amongst those trade-offs um, in order to get the development outcomes we're seeking. Well, thanks, Michelle. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, turning to Katie Taylor of the Pan American Development Foundation. Question. Thank you so much, Sam, and, and thank you to everyone who's here. Um, I have, the way we think about this, and this is a follow-on to Yanti's question and Michelle to your comments, is how can we find projects that give us a triple bottom line? That's kind of our holy grail. How do we get a social impact? Uh, we focus on promoting sustainable livelihoods. So how do we get a social impact so that there are dignified livelihoods that are environmentally uh, adaptive, environmentally smart, and that uh, are financially sustainable. Now the issue, and this gets down to uh, how do we ground the policy in real uh, practical ways. Uh, for instance, the DFC or the MCC have historically, perhaps no longer, which is why it's so exciting to see this whole of government approach, focused on really big deals. If we think about those things that generate livelihoods, that generate jobs, particularly in the area where I work, which is Latin America and the Caribbean, it's micro enterprises, it's small entrepreneurs, it's a variety of many, many, many small players that are often hard to finance, even with fantastic blended finance tools. So would love for there perhaps in this whole of government approach or with interaction to create some type of working group to try and focus in on real life examples of that. Some of it are already in the strategy document, uh, but it's exciting to see the, um, the, uh, the energy. And I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thanks for your time. Thanks for Abby and Dan for representing the whole uh, uh, mass of interaction NGOs so well. And I'm looking forward to working with you all. Over. Does so anyone want to respond to that, uh, David? Yeah. So th thank you very much for that comment. Um, and, you know, I, I I think there's a little give and take between your comments and, and Daniel Speckhardt's comments in terms of, you know, vision and macro versus micro. So the way I approach my role is we can lay out the policy framework and the vision, but that vision is expressed through individual projects or transactions. And so you know, what we're doing is we need to reorient our pipeline development and our activity towards the new priorities that we've laid out for the Biden administration, which includes climate. So I guess two, two other points. One is if you look at dollar value of the DFC's uh, commitments, the dollar value obviously skews towards larger transactions because you can have 20 small transactions for every large transaction, the large transaction may be better. If you look at the number of transactions, it's heavily skewed 70 to 75% of our transactions towards small transactions. And we are moving, you know, extraordinary amount of dollars every year towards small and medium enterprises um, that sometimes are as small, you know, microfinance are as small as 150, $180 per per loan, particularly in the agricultural space where, you know, we have microfinance programs for farmers where they buy seed, they buy fertilizer, um, they buy equipment at, you know, $180, $200 a pop. Um, so second is that we hope that you all can help identify projects on which we can act because ultimately that's the way that we express our policy priorities and so, you know, again, we have a large portfolio, it's $31 billion. It takes a long time to shift that, but I hope that on an annual flow basis, we can see a shift in our priorities in the next fiscal year um, and beyond. So thank you very much for that comment. And I, I really agree with it. And thank you, Sam, David. Sam, could I just add a very quick yeah, reflection? Jump in. Yeah, just very quickly, I wanted to add a, we talked about 
collaboration and we talk about coordination, I just want to add another C word, which is complementarity. And, and the reason I, I say that is I think we I think we need to have a common vision about what you know climate smart, inclusive development looks like. And then I think we need to understand each other and our respective strengths and sort of where we fit in. And, and then we need to act in a complementary way, I believe. But it's not about all of us doing the exact same thing. The agenda is actually really complex. What, our, what the countries want from us is, is more and more complex too, right? And so I think we can't all, each of us, you know, do everything well. So I think we need some specialization under, under a common vision and really understanding how we can connect with each other. And that's sometimes really difficult to do, right? To get our kind of money or our kind of expertise to connect with you know, your kind of money or expertise. I think that's the piece I hope that we can spend more time also thinking about to make sure that comprehensively together as a group, we cover the waterfront. Well, thanks, Alicia. I understand, David, you're gonna to have to, to leave us. Very much appreciate your, your being here with us. And I think one thanks of so the- much challenges we have here is, of course, the NGO themselves, uh, we, we bring many resources to the table and how we spend our own resources, how we leverage our own resources. But I noticed that, that Sean Callan from Catholic Relief Services had his hand up. So we'll give you the, Sean, we'll give you the last question and then uh, hear from uh, both Michelle and Alexia before we close. Thanks, Sam. And, and thanks, Alexia and Michelle. Really appreciate the enthusiasm and excitement that this is generating for all of us. Two, two key issues, I just think, as we work together and look at it, and I think it's been touched upon, but I just want to call it out more specifically. Uh, the, the first one is, if we're going to revolutionize the way we're doing it, we're going to really address these, we have to address two things. One is risk sharing uh, and the ability to understand that with our local, the local level and local partners and local leadership. And then the second one is time frame. We cannot do two-year projects or two-year initiatives. This needs to be a 10-year initiative. We need to invest in it. We need to make sure that it's consistent over the long term. We do short ones and it looks like it's gonna end. We don't get the commitment. We don't make the change. And so I think we're all committed, but I think we all need to work together on both of those elements, looking a little bit more at the, the risk sharing and can we lengthen the time frame given all the difficulties of procurement contracts and things that I, I think Daniel was alluding to. Thank you. Thanks. So Michelle first maybe and Alexia. Yeah, I'll just um, close. I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here today. And I really, um, you know, I, I really enjoy doing things virtually, but I also miss the interactions that we would have had prior at the beginning and the end of the session and being able to see folks in person. So I look forward to us getting to a point where we can do that. I just really want to um, stress the point that um, Alexia made at the end about complementarity. I think that what we were trying to present here, and I think what Jonathan was laying out in terms of how they thought about this, the, the climate summit tomorrow, is that there are lots of different things that need to be done and every agency in the US government has a different role to play. And we're all trying to figure out how we come together. So some of the documents that you will see tomorrow really try to lay that out and be clear about where you know, the work that USA does to build deal capacity, then DFC picks up the deal capacity how MCC does uh, local community uh, policy change and how we then come in with resources to implement that policy change. And they, they do as well. You know, what the role of state, the role of diplomacy in these efforts to get really the will um, from the governments to be part of these decisions. So um, I just want to say one of the things that's been very different for me in this administration is just how the whole of government um, impact has really been really strong and how we're working with also the domestic agencies. Um, on some of these issues, agriculture, energy, others. Um, so I just would want to say thank you so much. I appreciate the commitment that Interaction and all the members here have. And we look forward to lots of interaction moving forward um, with all of you to get your thoughts, wisdom as we build plans, programs, and, and ways of working. Thank you. Alexia. Yes, no, and I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to echo Michelle's thank you. I mean, I came energized, but I'm sort of like now, you know, almost walking on water, right, with, with, with even new, new energy, listening to you, listening to the feedback from Abby and Christian and the questions and comments that have been made. And I think, um, you know, it was actually music to my ear to hear what Daniel said about, um, you know, we sort of understand that we need a diverse set of tools. We're ready to look at different approaches, ready to try things differently. I remember in 2015, I was in the U.S. government at that time with the Financing for Development 
a conference thinking about financing for the SDGs and there were just so many and no miss looking at, you know, as now said, there were so many, you know, sort of discussions about the basics of who's evil and who's good and who can we trust. And I just was like, ah, oh. and so I think it was just music to hear this. And so now at least if we're, if we can, if we're not having those philosophical debates, then the question is mechanically, how do we make it work? And I think that is challenging by the way, again. And I think it does require fresh and new thinking from all of us on this call, from our friends at OMB, from all kinds of people, our friends on the Hill. Um, and I think that's a whole agenda as well that it would, that would be good to work with you on because as we try and do things differently, I think the risk sharing point from, from is, is, is really critical, but it does mean doing things differently. <laughs> Um, and, and, and maybe not all those things will work out. Um, and so the transparency about what doesn't work, the learning from that, but creating the space to do that, I think we still have some ways to go. And I think if we can sort of the collective action point that was made earlier, if we can sort of collectively try and push some of these doors open, that would make a, a, a huge difference. Um, I think I'll also end by saying that our climate strategy uh, that I mentioned that, that we are, are finalizing this week um, also makes a really strong point about um, deepening partnerships, including with CSOs, and has a couple of specific ideas that I may want to come back to to some of you, perhaps through through interaction. But I I, I hope to, this is just the beginning of a long uh, conversation, but also a conversation that transmits down to real action on the ground with real people. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. One thing we've learned from a crisis is that it motivates us to do things differently and we can do things differently. Here we're sitting in this great big conference room, lots of screens looking at each other, having an intense conversation with high energy. It's not the same as all being together. We'd love to have that, but it shows that we could do that differently and we can step up. And our challenge here, having living through this pandemic crisis is to recognize we have this much larger crisis that's looming, that's here with us longer term. And it's going to require the same degree of need to step up in the short term and in the long term. But really wanted to take a moment here to, to thank our panelists, uh, you know, Jonathan, uh, Michelle, Alexia, and David for, for your thoughts, your perspectives, uh, the energy you bring, the leadership you bring, and the coherence you've brought to us for this vision that we're seeing in, in the Biden administration. And for all of you that, you know, we're all showing up in our little screens here talking and, and really uh, thank you. I think we need to acknowledge the tremendous work that is being done by the organizations, all of you that are showing up here and that you'll continue to be doing uh, in the coming years. Uh, and that we know that we can't have these conversations without your voice, without your perspectives. And we look forward to continuing to work with all of you uh, and going forward. So thank you. And this will conclude our uh, gathering today. Now is the chance we get around to tap shoulders and say hi to people, exchange cards and do all those fun things. Um, or we could just click the button and say leave uh, and see each other at the next time. So thank you all for joining us. It's been a great, uh, great gathering. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, Sam. And thank you. Great seeing everybody. Thank you. Thank you.